All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to yet another uh, homotopy type theory electronic seminar talk. Um, and just a quick reminder, we ask you to keep your mics off and cameras on during the talk. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions and we will have now a one hour talk followed by up to 30 minutes of discussion. Um, and I think I don't need to say anything else other than introducing our speaker today, Paolo Capriotti from Darmstadt, who will speak about polynomial monads as upper topic types. Right. Thanks, Chris. And thanks to Chris and Dan for organizing this. I, um, I had a lot of fun watching the previous talks, so I'm really happy to, to be here to, to talk today myself. And so my plan for today is to kind of give an unofficial continuation to Eric Finster's talk from, I believe it was uh, December last year. Yeah. Um, so what he did is kind of present some, a definition of an analytic moment that's kind of suitable for being formalized in type theory, uh, which somehow like would give us a way to encode a notion of infinity category internally and or even infinity operate more generally. And so this is kind of in contrast with uh, somehow the more traditional approach and approach that many people, including myself, have tried before uh, for doing an infinity category theory and, and type theory, which was essentially to start with some notion of diagrams, some kind of uh, type uh, space value or type value to sheaves over some, some shapes, some, uh, some basic category that you start with, for example, uh, the simplicial category or the semi-simplicial category, and then have some kind of impose uh, some sort of Siegel condition on top of those and recover a notion of Siegel spaces in the simplicial case, semi-Siegel spaces in the semi-simplicial case, we maybe with some completeness condition added and kind of follow one of the, the approaches that have been used in traditional developments of higher algebra and higher category theory uh, and, and kind of replicate that in type theory. Uh, but so in, uh, in Finster's approach, uh, kind of you can, one can think of it as a way to sidestep this, uh, this technique, uh, which don't go to, through to some pre-sheaves pre at all, but directly kind of encode in a co-inductive way the algebraic structure underlying an opera or a or more specifically on a, uh, an infinity category. So what I want to do in my talk is um, kind of, sh kind of uh, reconcile these two points of view and show how you can actually think of uh, Finster's definition as a way to uh, first encode a notion of opitopic space, or opitopic type, so some kind of uh, pre-sheaf over the category of opitopes, and then uh, impose a single condition on top of that. So get something that you could call uh, orthotopic Siegel spaces, which are then equivalent to Finster's notion of an analytic moment. So what I'm not going to do, because I don't know how, is show that uh, this is actually correct in the appropriate sense. So it really gives you a definition of something that is equivalent to other previously established definitions of an infinity operand. But uh, so actually what I'm thinking at the moment, so my current progress in trying to unravel this is that it, it's not actually, it doesn't seem to me to be uh, correct as is. So what I'm going to do is like show a reformulation of uh, Finster's definition, which so, so that's equivalent and it's pretty easy to see that it's equivalent. So basically what I'm saying is that both of them are not actually uh, correct in this sense, they don't exactly model infinity operands. But so my hope is that, I mean, so the general hope also talking with Eric about this, uh, it seems that the fix shouldn't be like too hard to come up with. Uh, and my hope is that my, my way of thinking about it would at least give some, some other perspective that would help find what, what exactly is wrong with the definition and, and how to fix it. So I don't know if I have time to, to get to this show where, where the problems are, but well, we'll see. We'll see how far I get. 
Um, and yeah, so I don't really have a precise statement that, that says that this is wrong, uh, but it really just, just going through an example, you can see that things start going a bit wrong at higher levels of the coherence. Yeah, that's what I have so far. So, okay, uh, let me first, okay, let's see. Let's do this. Okay. Okay, can we start with trying to kind of um, express a bit more precisely what, what, it, what it is that we're, I'm trying to, to talk about, what, what the problem is. So let's say we have C, some uh, category. So this is, I'm assuming that I'm working in some version of hot, some type theory. So C, just for concreteness, you can assume that it's uh, expressed as some AKS category, some I mean, you have a type of objects and a set of morphisms for any two objects and the usual categorical structure and, and, and univalence as well. Uh, so the problem for me is, is the following. Uh, define a type of pre-sheaves over C. Uh, so pre-sheaves over C, which is supposed to be uh, a type of homotopy coherent, whatever that means, uh, pre-sheaves or type valued pre-sheaves on C. So, of course, I mean, it's a bit strange to, to, to kind of present an open problem with just uh, giving a definition because we also have to say what it means for this definition to be correct. So for me, okay, and maybe other people would have other kind of points of view on this, but for now, like just for concreteness, I will fix some kind of semi-precise way to, to make sense of the problem, which is, uh, what I want to have is a, a type, uh, so pre shift C has to be a type which you can write down in, internally in type theory with no, no external help, which is you know, some expression using C and the type formers of type theory. And, uh, and the correctness condition is that if you, uh, so the interpretation of this type, uh, in the simplicial model, uh, matches up to a weak equivalent the, in some sense, uh, correct or established or whatever uh, notion, correct, let's say, infinity group void of pre-sheet sourcing. So basically you start with C, which is some internal thing, then you can interpret that into simplicial sets. That should give you something that's an infinity category uh, in whatever formalism you prefer for infinity categories, maybe. So you can build a quasi-category out of C, say. Then you can take the quasi-category quasi of uh, pre-sheaves over C, uh, valued in, in spaces. Uh, so that's a quasi-category as well. Then you take the core of that, that's an infinity group void. And what I'm asking is that this group void matches the interpretation of, uh, so it's weakly equivalent to the interpretation of pre-sheaves. So, okay, this is one way to just, uh, to have a concrete kind of correctness condition. Uh, so are there any questions so far? Like, are people happy with this generally? Any comments? Nope. Okay. So I continue. Oh, sorry. Uh, yep. Um, just, I, I don't know if I've thought much before about the interpretation of a univalent category 
in like say the superficial set model of homotopy type theory, do we know exactly what sort of categories those correspond to semantically? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I was thinking about that uh, earlier. And I'm actually not sure if anybody has written this up, but so intuitively what would happen, what should happen is that uh, AKS cat univalent AKS categories uh, correspond uh, up to weak equivalents to infinity categories that are um, that are actually uh, one categories. So, uh, so I'm not sure how what the precise statement would be, but uh, take one categories, the like ordinary categories, and bed them into quasi categories. Take the the core of the, this subcategory, and that should be the interpretation of the type of AKS categories. I'm not sure if this has been proved, but it shouldn't be too hard to do, no? because uh, the home sets being sets gives you all the coherence for free. So, uh, well, okay, so at least modulo this fact. Uh, so first, of course, you need to establish that the notion of category uh, that we're using here for C is itself correct, and then we can talk about correctness of pre sheaves over C. So if that somehow doesn't quite work, then maybe we can kind of restrict these categories to be something that we understand better and then play the same game. So for example, we could take categories that, ha that have a strict uh, associativity. Uh, so uh, composition that's strictly associative. So we cannot write that internally, but we can just focus on a fixed C and that has this property and play this game, for example. Then it would be easier to see what that corresponds to in the interpretation. Does that answer more or less the question? I, I was just wondering what's known and what's not known, so yes. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So that's what we want to do. And what do we know? At least what do I know? <laughs> I know that, uh, as far as I know, this is not easy to do at all with like arbitrary C but it's uh, pretty straightforward to do for some examples. And I'm not sure exactly like, if there's a way to kind of characterize the examples for which this is easy to do. They seem to fall into different kind of families. Uh, so for example, uh, if C is a group point, then we can do it because we, we just define pre sheaves of C to be uh, as definition, uh, just uh, this. So we take the, um, the objects of C, which is a uh, one type, because C is invariant, and, uh, and then we just take functions into U, and the functoriality just comes automatically because uh, because of univariance. Right. So what else? If C is free on a graph, that's another example that's been worked out. Free uh, on a graph and right, easy to, to say what this means. And basically in that case, we can just do the obvious thing. pre sheaves would be uh, graph morphisms into U and yeah, things work because basically here there are no coherence to, to worry about. So we just have a map on objects, a map on morphisms, everything will work. And and then there are other examples that are not really free in any sense, as far as I can, can tell. But still, you can make this work. Uh, so for example, I, I guess there's a whole, okay, let's say, one example that is not free, as far as I can say, in, a, in any kind of generalization of this, of this sense, is the, the globe cat. So something that looks like this, we have objects, natural numbers, and then we have two arrows uh, between any two numbers. Uh, we have an arrow, two, exactly two, arrow from, two arrows from n to m whenever n is less or equal to m. And yeah, they have some relations. I mean, I'm sure most people are familiar with this. And here it turns out we can indeed define uh, pre sheaves over this globe category. And, Okay, these are what you can call uh, globular, globular types. You can define them either co-inductively or maybe just by restricting first 
to uh, some subcategory up to n and defining what pre-sheaves over that are by induction in n and then kind of taking a limit. And so what, what makes this work, it seems at first, is that uh, G is a so-called uh, direct category. So just by the way that it's defined, we can assign a degree to any object which is a natural number. So in this case, it's just the object itself regarded as a natural number. So we have some degree function. So let's say, let's say C is a direct category, it means that there is a degree function from objects to natural numbers. And so maybe you have to say that the objects form a set, something like that. And then we say that if F is a non-identity arrow, uh, from x to y, then the degree increases. Yeah, this should be enough. Uh, so, yeah, of course, g is a special case of this. And there seems to be some kind of general strategy to define uh, three sheaves over a direct category, but it turns out it doesn't quite work in the general case. So, but, but let me outline the, the general strategy. So we, what we do is take these subcategories of objects of degree less or equal to n, and then we define for sheaves by induction on n. So while well, we have some base case, that's usually easy to do. And then the recursive case is going to be a sigma type of some pre sheaf over one less degree together with just one family from some object here, some type, which I call uh, delta x, into you. So basically, the idea is we, we recursively define the pre sheaf up to n, and then we just add one single family over a specific type here, that's determined by the, 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 the pre sheaf up to, up to n, and that will allow us to assemble a new pre sheaf up to n plus one. So for example, and so the idea is that this delta is uh, kind of mutually defined with, with pre sheaves. And it's, so this is not like a definition that's parametric in C. The idea is that you fix a C and then you try to come up with a definition of uh, delta that works for that C, uh, exploiting the particular structure of C. So for G, this works perfectly. Delta is defined in, uh, recursively in terms of the previous delta. It's all easy. Similarly, uh, like a simpler version of this is uh, where you have omega, like uh, the ordinal omega, just one arrow between n and n plus one. Same, same deal. All right. But so if we try to apply this to uh, delta plus, the semi simplicial category, which is direct. This doesn't quite work for reasons that honestly, I still like to this day don't quite comprehend. Uh, so this mutual definition seems to be all, all okay. Like you can try to define delta in terms of the previous delta on the lower dimension and it seems to work. If you do it on paper, it works actually, <laughs> but if you formalize it, it doesn't. That's basically what happened. And so there are some subtle issues related to strictness of things and the, the kind of the knot in the recursive definition doesn't quite tie itself. Uh, so yeah, that's as far as I know the state of the art be, before uh, Eric's talk. And so my own uh, interpretation of what Eric has done is, uh, is the, the following idea, so, so yeah, idea Finster's construction. At least, my, it's my interpretation of the idea. The idea is uh, apply this, apply uh, the, the, this pattern, this template, the, the recursive definition of pre sheaves for uh, C equals the, the category of opatopes. And so, uh, curiously enough, uh, Eric doesn't actually mention opatopes very much in his talk. 
Uh, but I mean, I think ultimately that's that's where the definition comes from. At least that's the way I see it. And and also, like interestingly, we don't actually need to define what opatops are to make this go. So all we really need to do is define this delta, right, that we had here. I mean, this is the whole the crucial point of the definition. And of course, delta. Uh, Delta has a, has a general definition that works for NEC, but that we can only use if we already have a system to talk about categories and functors. So that's why here we actually need a specific definition of delta. And this specific definition, uh, I think Finster's insight is that in the case of OSC being opatopes, we can actually give uh, internally. And the, the, the knot kind of can be tied in that case. All right. So, and yeah, and second, second thing is that we can do this by working almost uh, completely within the world of polynomials. Yeah, so that's what I'm going to try to, to show. Okay, so let me uh, kind of start talking about polynomials now. So we already had two talks in hottest about polynomials so far, at least at least two talks. Uh, one yeah, by Eric himself, he ex gave a definition of polynomials and worked through his uh, construction of analytic monads. And then we had a talk by Joachim Koch, so developing uh, analytic monads through, monads through polynomials. And so yeah, this is going to be a third one, which I think is, uh, is, is okay, because I really, I, I think there are indeed three fundamentally different definitions of polynomials that are kind of equivalent, but they kind of show different aspects and make it easy to understand certain, uh, certain features of polynomials. E each one of them can, is kind of uh, better than the others at certain, certain things. So it's good to have all three in mind, and we haven't seen the third one, so yeah, that's what I'm going to kind of show here. So I'll say, I mean, so these are the three definitions. One I would call type theoretic. And this is what uh, Eric showed. And there is a categorical one, which uh, was uh, shown by uh, Joachim. And then the one in the stock, I, I call it uh, indexed, because in a sense, it's kind of the opposite. So I would say, um, so the categorical definition is completely based on total spaces. The type theoretic definition is indexed over the outputs. Now, this will be clearer later. And the index definition is uh, indexed over everything. So it's like completely indexed. So it's like uh, index and categorical are the two extremes and the type theoretic definition is some kind of uh, middle ground. Okay, so what's the, what's the basic idea as usual? So I'm, going, I'm not going to spend much time because we've seen polynomials a lot in previous talks, but so basically a polynomial is going to contain a, a type I of sorts. So we think of a polynomial as some kind of specification of an algebraic signature. That's one way to, to think about it. So we have a type of sorts. These are the sorts of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the elements on which these operations are going to be, on, on which the algebraic operations are going to be applied. And then uh, let's just consider this fixed for all three of the definitions. So definition one, what we do is we consider a family op indexed over i, with the idea is, uh, that op is operations indexed by output sort. So these are operations by output, if that makes sense. So for any output sort, I get the whole type of operations by that sort. And then you need something to encode the inputs and that's given by another family, param, which takes an operation. So okay, first takes an output sort, we call it j, then an operation with that output sort, and then an input sort, and it gives me a family, uh, sorry, it gives me a type of operations with those constraints. So the, this uh, return type here will be uh, all the operations, uh, sorry, no, no. It will be the parameter, so it will be the inputs of this particular operation that has this particular input sort. Okay, so the input positions in which I'm going to 
be able to put my elements for the algebraic structure. Okay, so that was a definition that Finster talked about. And definition two is the more categorical one. And, and it's just really very easy to say. It's just a diagram of this form. So, yeah, that's it. So two types and arrows in this, arranged uh, in this fashion. So what's the idea here is that, well, I is the same as before, and uh, A is the total space of the operation, so all the operations. And A prime, uh, we can think of as operations with a marked input. So oh, yeah, an element of A prime is an, a pair of an operation and then some kind of marking on one of the inputs of that operation. And then, you know, P forgets the marking. Uh, so yeah, P forgets marking. T uh, is the output sort of an operation and S is the input. corresponding to the marking. All right. So, well, just let me, let me like, briefly show how you kind of go from one to the other, at least, well, just one way, just to kind of get a bit more comfortable with these representations. So, for example, let's say we have open param, what, what, is, what are A, A prime PTS? In that case, so A is a sigma type of all the operations. So we have pairs of an output sort and an operation in the other sense. A prime is going to be for all of this plus a marking. So to have a marking, we need to have both an input and an output sort, and then an operation, and then uh, one parameter that says where I'm going to put the mark, okay? And then, okay, maybe let me just write, P forgets the marking, so P, I, J, A, X is J, A. T is the output sort, so T just returns J. Okay, uh, T is, T only takes J and A and returns J, and S takes all of that and returns I. Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So let me show you uh, this. Uh, okay, maybe I should say that there is another uh, variant of one, which maybe you can call one prime, and I don't really consider it a different definition, it's uh, very, very, very similar to one, where op is the same and param, param is replaced by two things, some function, some family RIT that only, so it's the family of all the parameters of a single operation rather than the ones with a single specified sort. And then that we have a function that tells me which sort that every single one of those has. So sort of, let me skip the parameters. It's going to be from RT of A into I. So, okay. This is not the new definition that I want to talk about. Uh, the new one. Oh. New one is uh, a way to index everything, to index a polynomial over both the inputs and the outputs. So, polynomial is just one family that looks like this. We fix a uh, no uh, type u in some universe, and then a, a family of input sorts, just one output sort, and out, out comes the set or the type of operations with that kind of uh, input output profile. Say. So, so this is some kind of uh, space of uh, input, inputs. These are the sort, uh, the input sorts. This is the single output sort. 
and the, and the return value is uh, the operations. So how do we, let me see, let me show you how you kind of convert maybe like three to two, just to get an idea. So it's very similar to before. So the operations, the total space of operations is simply the sigma type of everything here. So we have a, an X, a family, uh, input i's, a single output i, j, and then an operation, p i, j. And a prime is all of that. So x, i, j, and a, and a, and uh, a marking, right? We have to mark one of the inputs. And so the type of inputs is conveniently here as X. So we just put an X. Okay. So this is a pair of uh, an operation and an X, an element of X. And uh, so what do the functions do? So the, okay, let me write them. The target of something like this is simply just there, it's just the J. And the source of a marked operation it's just given by i applied to that parameter, that input. Okay, so there, I think there are many, many reasons why this is a nice definition. And so, for example, reason one is that morphisms, polynomials, are pretty polynomials, kind of obvious in this representation. Like they, it's kind of clear that they uh, they correspond to the correct or the useful at least notion of morphism, because here we uh, in, in definition three or let's, let's say maybe in, in definition two, the, the notion of morphism of polynomials that, that it's used, um, and that we've seen with uh, with Joachim, is that let's say we have two polynomials like this. And so here I'm, I'm really focusing on polynomials over a fixed uh, type of sorts. And then the morphism is given by completing this into a fully commutative diagram where the central square is a pullback. So like you can try to figure out why this is correct, but I think easy way to see this, but correct, I mean, or at least it's, uh, it's reasonable, it's a reasonable definition, but I would say one justification is that it really corresponds to the notion of pointwise morphisms coming from three and converting back and forth into two. So there, if we have P and Q polynomials in the, in the sense three, so families like that. Then morphism P to Q, it's going to simply be a family for all x, i, and j, family of functions from p, i, j to q, i, j. And if you kind of go through the identification, you really get exactly this notion of uh, with the pullback square in the middle. Okay, so that's one thing. Second thing that I like about three is that, uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, it makes it clear that um, polynomials, at least within this uh, the setup that we we built, form an infinity topos, because ultimately polynomials defined like this are simply families, and families over anything form an infinity topos. So really, it's just uh, polynomials over this fixed. Uh, sort type i uh, is just a slice of u itself, or whatever, like the, the model in which we're working with over this, this complicated thing here. Yeah, okay, so this is a bigger universe here, u1. So 
I mean, we, of course, this is hard to really make precise. We're kind of doing this to try to bootstrap some infinity category theory, so we don't know what an infinity topos is yet internally, so this doesn't really make sense, but it ought to be true once everything is established, right? Because it's just a slice of the, of the universe, or some big enough universe. Uh, but it, so what we really care about, of point two, at least for this talk, is that we can do products. This is an interesting construction as products of polynomials that I had never seen. Had seen before. Hello, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I think maybe I missed a point there. Uh, could you say a little bit about the, the size issues in that uh, claim yeah. there? Are those two universes different universes? Yeah, I was hoping to gloss uh, <laughs> over this, but uh, so maybe I guess one way to, to think about this is that when we go to uh, definition two, one could kind of state this definition without ever mentioning universes, right? Because you could say polynomial is given by a bunch of types. You don't have to talk about universes and maps, right? On the other hand, definition three has a universe here in the indexing. So clearly you can't ever talk about three uh, without universes, which means that in particular two and three cannot really be equivalent, right? But, so the, the way that they're equivalent is that uh, three is equivalent to two plus the fact that P has uh, fibers that are contained in, in, in this universe U. So you fix some universe U and then you have a notion of uh, say U small polynomials, which are those whose fibers are U small, U small, the fibers of P I mean. And then that gives you an identification. So here what you would say is that polynomials over i that are uh, u small, and, and this itself is a slice uh, of the category of polynomials, by the way. But in any case, uh, this category is equivalent to, I mean, this u1 in this, from this point of view is kind of like e, where e is the model in which this is happening. I mean, that's one way to think about it. Does that kind of answer the question? Uh, yeah, pretty much. So uh, corresponding to putting E there in your re previous definition of, of three, the, the U in the target of your dependent family. Yeah, should be yeah that's three, right. Not just the ah, same. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So maybe you can put U1 here and leave U1 Got over it. here and also have the assumption that when we talk about types, we're talking about types in U1. Uh, I mean, in say here in definition two. So all these types are going to be in E1. Yeah, plus the fibers of P are in U. Yeah, okay, this is a bit annoying to stay precisely. But... All right, so in fact, polynomials with no restrictions, as far as I understand, don't actually form an infinity topos, but so you have to put some size constraint. And the usual result that you see is that uh, any slice of the category of polynomials is an infinity topos. And restricting the fibers of P is actually equivalent to taking a slice over a certain polynomial that you can build out of U. Right. So, okay, so products. So products in representation three are uh, very easy to, to construct. It's just the obvious thing. If you have Q, P and Q, then uh, the family of operations over I and J is just the product of the ones in I and P and the ones in Q. And then if you go back and translate this into any of the other representations, you get something that's not as intuitive. So products work really well uh, in the presentation three. And products are really useful. They come up a lot in the, in the construction of uh, analytic monads. So in, in uh, Eric's talk, they were kind of hidden and, and they are there, but they're a bit hard to see. But so uh, we'll see, we'll see how they come up. So for example, let me, let me just uh, maybe show how this uh, looks in uh, representation one, so the, the type theoretic one. So let's say we have op and param for, for P and op and param for Q. So what is op of P times Q? It's this kind of slightly awkward thing where we take, yes, a pair of uh, an operation in P and an operation in, in Q. But also, 
So we need to add uh, something that kind of relates the parameters of A with the parameters of B. So a family of equivalences over input sorts between the parameters of A and the parameters of B. So this, so a variation of this is what Eric calls a frame, at least in the special, in, in the special case that we'll see later. So these frames kind of come up naturally when you look at products and polynomials. So this is one advantage of representation three, or in general, like observing the polynomials uh, with some provisos for Matopos. Uh, okay. Right. Next thing about polynomials is this uh, simple observation. So here I'm using representation two right now. Let's say we have some polynomial. Looks like this. And also some family over A. So some kind of display map from some other type into A. So the, the kind of obvious statement is that there's a unique way to complete this into a diagram of, of two, like a morphism of two polynomials, where the bottom one is this. And so there is a unique way to extend the top row into a whole polynomial uh, in such a way that it's equipped with a morphism into, into the bottom row that extends this one. And it's quite clear because Okay, so this, I'm saying this with the uh, sorts being fixed to be I. So there's a unique way to construct a map here that makes the triangle commute, right, the composition. And there is a unique way to create a new type here that makes this into a pullback, because we just take the pullback of this uh, uh, co-span. And then this triangle has to commute, so there's a unique way to, to add an arrow here that makes the triangle commute, again, the composition. So. And you can state this very elegantly in terms of something being some Cartesian vibration, but well, it's a simple, simple-minded way to say this that kind of works well enough is to just say that if we take polynomials over I and slice it over P, so let's say P is this one on the bottom, that's equivalent to uh, just uh, the slice of our, I mean, this would be U1. Okay, let's ignore these size issues. Uh, the slice of the kind of universe in which we're working with, uh, in which we're working over A, right? Because we, we saw that given uh, a family over A is enough to reconstruct the whole polynomial over P, and conversely, given polynomial in particular gives you a map over A. Okay, so this is quite simple. and. Uh, kind of obvious consequence of this is that if we have some other polynomial Q, it's kind of arbitrary, except for the fact that here on the, on the operation place, we have the same thing. So note that uh, this is where uh, representation two is really nice, because in, in the other representations of polynomials, it's quite hard to say what this means, because uh, saying uh, in the type theoretic representation, uh, this one will be indexed over a completely different type, J here. So, yeah, okay, sure. You, you can take the sigma types and say that they're equivalent. But here it's quite natural. So you just look at the, this thing appearing in third position. And if it's, if it's the same, then of course, by this argument, this is also the same as uh, polynomials over J on J over Q. Yeah, simply by yeah, the same argument. So basically what we can do is given two polynomials, if we observe that they have the same operations, then we can freely transport uh, families, uh, polynomial families, let's say, over them into, uh, yeah, between each other. Okay, this will be useful later. Okay. All right, next thing I want to talk about is uh, trees. And so we've seen this, where, again, uh, with uh, both talks that I mentioned before. So let me just give a quick introduction again. So, so these, we're going to fix the polynomial P and define a few uh, types connected to P. So the type of trees over P is, I mean, these are called P trees. 
these are, uh, so I'll, I'll just keep it a bit intuitive. Maybe not too hard to see how you make this precise. So a P tree is going to be some a choice of a tree. Uh, and here by tree, I mean a non-planar tree with a finite branching together with a labeling of the nodes with operations. So, okay, let's write P as the usual. That's P. So we put a bunch of A's here on the nodes. A1, A2, A3. And we put I's, elements of I on the edges. Okay, I'll just do this. Uh, 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 the corolla attached to the root. Uh, and here, the con and, and plus we have a condition that says that the, uh, uh, so that, um, so, so it's the intuitive thing. So uh, if, if we think of A1 uh, as an, an operation, so the parameters of uh, A1, so the, uh, what I call RIT in representation one prime of A1, must be identified with the uh, branching of that of the corresponding node. So the, the type of branches of the corresponding node. Okay, it's a bit informal, but I hope it's not too confusing. Uh, in such a way that the sorts match. And the same way the uh, the output of A1 needs to match whatever I I put here as the label of the edge. Okay, so say it again. So we have a tree and then we label every node with an operation, every edge with a sort, and things match in kind of the obvious way. Right? That's a P tree. And okay, so if you want to, to make this a bit more precise, you can just follow what, uh, what uh, Eric has uh, explained. It's quite easy to give a type theoretical definition of this as a W type. So the way you do it is that you define some type W uh, indexed over I. So that's going to be trees indexed over the sort of the root. And this is just a simple inductive family. And it's actually the prototypical inductive family. So, okay, not really too hard to do this. So then we have another type, tree prime. So these are P trees with a marked Uh, leaf. So simply just the same as a p-tree, but we also add some little marker at one of the leaves here. Yeah. So a leaf is an edge that has, it's not, it's only connected to one node. Well, and it's not the root. And then we have a similar one, a tree bullet of p, which is uh, p-trees with a marked uh, node. So uh, again, a P tree, and then we kind of put a marking on one of the nodes, internal nodes here. All right, so I should say, I learned all this formalism from, uh, from, uh, from Joachim Koch's uh, work on the polynomials and, uh, and uh, open hopes. But, so, yeah, so I don't know exactly the, where this originates. I, I believe it's due to him, yeah. And so this is uh, no problem to replicate in type theory, of course. Okay, so now, uh, given all of this, what we can do is, uh, maybe I'll leave it here. If you start with the polynomial P, we can build a new polynomial P star. The idea being that this is the free monad in P. And okay, we don't know how to make sense of this yet, but this is what we are aiming for but we simply define it explicitly as the polynomial that looks like this. We have these trees, trees with a marked leaf, and I again. And the maps are the obvious ones. So here we forget the marking, and uh, here we take the, mark, uh, the sort of the marked leaf on the left, and on the right, we just take the sort of the root. So now what we can do is the following trick. We start with P, we build P star times P. So these are 
Okay, so let me denote this polynomial uh, with this. So I introduced this notation delta just to stand for the operations and the parameters of this particular polynomial obtained as a product. The idea is that uh, delta, so this delta p here, these operations of this polynomial are, uh, are what, like pairs of a tree over p, then a single corolla, so a single operation, and then a way to kind of um, identify the leaves of the tree with the leaves of the corolla. Yeah? So here I'm identifying uh, an operation with a single, with a simple tree that just has one node. So that's what uh, delta p is. The other thing that we can do is, uh, so, so far we haven't used tree bullet, right? Only tree uh, prime. Tree bullet comes in here because we can do, we can start building a polynomial as follows. We, we keep the trees as the operations, but then we use the nodes as the, as the parameters. So we think of a tree as being an operation whose input places are on the nodes rather than the leaves. Yeah, we can try to do something like this. And it's easy to see what the input, I mean, we can put an A here, right? Because uh, any node is in particular, in particular labeled with an operation, so we can extract that operation. But unfortunately, we have no way to kind of connect this to some uh, output operation, because there's no way for a general polynomial P to take a whole tree of operations and kind of convert it into a single operation. But what we can do, actually, let me move this. All right, so, two, A, three bullet, A. What we can do is take this delta P here that comes from P star times P. And since this is uh, the operations of a product, in particular, we get these uh, projection functions at the level of operations, one into trees, which is this factor here, and one into A, which corresponds to this factor. And then now we can do a similar trick as before, namely we can take a pullback here, and I just call this delta bullet, and then compose on this side. So we end, we end up, so the, the bottom wasn't quite a polynomial, we, we were missing this bit here on the right, but the top is a polynomial. Right? There's, there's really nothing to check as long as we have a diagram of this one. And this polynomial on the top, I will denote as BD of P. And BD here stands for bias dolan which is somehow like, so this is not quite the bias dolan construction applied to P, because that only works when P is a polynomial monad, but it's something that's it's kind of the same idea in there. Uh, so the actual bias dolan construction would be uh, somehow doing it at the, this bottom row, which we cannot do at this generality. So yeah, I label this, I, 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 I'm calling this BD to kind of reference the, the connection to the bias dolan construction. But anyway, so you can just take it as the definition here. Okay, and now just by construction, we see that BD of P and this other polynomial that we considered yeah, here, P star times P, have the same operations. And the other thing that I don't really have time to explain, so kind of, I'll just state it as a lemma, is that uh, for any polynomial P, BD of P, all right, maybe it, wait, before saying this, let me introduce uh, kind of, yeah, basically the final ingredient that we need to restate uh, Eric's definition, which is the, the, the notion of magma. Okay, so let's say that P is a polynomial. So a magma structure over P is a morphism M from P star to P. That's it. Now the lemma is that BD of P 
is a man. I mean, so this is what? Well, not just is a magma, but like there is a specified magma structure that we're going to use later. And this is contained in uh, Eric's uh, explanation in the talk. So there's a bunch of functions that he defines. They're not quite, I mean, they're not quite explained in terms of BD, but really they fit very nicely and they really all together, they really give you a magma structure for BD. There's very little work you have to do to adapt them. And they're called, like, I think, flatten, and then there's uh, uh, something he calls BDFRM, something like this. Uh, and so, yeah, so this BD is the same as this BD. And yes. So this is some combinatorial work that needs to be done in terms of trees. Okay, now we can put everything together and get uh, the definition of a coherent magma. So, Let's say we start with P and we start with a magma structure on P. So the general uh, pattern of the definition is that we want to say what it means for M to be coherent. And a coherent magma structure will then be a monad structure on P. And from there you can do infinity categories, infinity operators. So what's a coherent? coherent. Uh, so M is coherent. Uh, means the following, two things. M is, is subdivision invariant. Which I'll explain in a second. And then some derived like so-called slice polynomial built out of the previously introduced stuff. So something that we uh, built, it's built out of P and M uh, and a corresponding magma structure that, that I call M prime, which is built using all the previous components. So PM and the, the witness of subdivision invariance. So again, stuff that I need to define now. This uh, magma is coherent. So maybe I, let me say here, PM as a magma is coherent if M is subdivision invariant and some derived other magma is itself coherent, uh, co-inductive. So that's the general pattern of the definition, exactly like uh, Eric presented it. So now I'm going to define all these notions in terms of what we introduced before. Okay, so, so first, what does it mean to be subdivision invariant? So what we do is we take the magma structure and we make it induce a map of this form. That's quite easy because this is an actual product in polynomials. So we can take the identity on the first component and the magma structure on the second component and get this map. Okay, now, what, now let's observe that this has the same operations as BD, right? We, we, we mentioned this already. And this is some kind of polynomial over it. So that means that we can kind of induce a new polynomial over this one. And this is what was called P over M. So this uh, idea of a slice polynomial is simply just going through the equivalence that we talked about okay, way before, uh, of uh, polynomials over uh, some fixed polynomial and polynomials over some other polynomial with the same operations. Okay, so that's how you get the slice. And then the other thing that you can do is uh, apply the star, the free monad operation on it. So star is functorial. So from this map, we get a map of the stars, and now BDP is a magma, so we can go down to BD of P. Okay, so from a map from uh, P slice M to BD, we actually uh, get a whole uh, a map from the trees over P uh, slice M. Now, Subdivision invariance, M subdivision invariant means that we have a lift for the following uh, diagram. So we put this map here on the bottom, we put the original map P slice M on the right, and we ask for the existence of a lift. 
and of course the corresponding witness of community. So existence, well, clearly in a, the proof relevant sense. So uh, subdivision invariance is a pair of a lift and a witness that it is indeed a lift. Okay, and yeah, and now, now it's clear that from a, such a lift, you get the magma structure on P, on P, uh, on P slice n, right? It's just, so that's what I call n prime. So it's just part of the lift itself. It's the actual map. Okay, so that makes the definition go through. And, and, and I, I think it's, it's pretty easy to check that this is equivalent to what Eric presented. Uh, modular, you know, unfolding a few things here and there and making sure that the magma structure that you get on P, D, D, P corresponds to the, its various functions and introduced. So, okay, how much time? We have okay. uh, well officially you're one minute past. Okay. Uh, if there's a good punchline coming, then yeah, I mean just maybe let's see if in like five ten minutes I can I can uh, kind of uh, introduce my alternative definition of this. So this is uh, completely equivalent, but it really shows how you can think of this in terms of isotopic spaces. All right. So let's try to keep it closer to five. But five. All right. I'll try. <laughs> So, okay, it's uh, several, st like three stages. So first I have a notion of uh, opisopic tower that works like this. We have a family of polynomials PI and the sorts of PI plus one same as the operations of P PI. Uh, so this is kind of the, the kind of relation that you get when you do P, uh, BD, right? But, but here we're just any polynomials. And plus we have a projection kind of function from PI plus one into BD of PI. Yeah, this kind of, this mirrors what we, we expect to get in terms of a pre-sheaf of a, of a direct category, right? So this BD works as the boundary of PI and somehow magically here we are trying to make it work in a way that the boundary only uses the, the current level. Yeah. So that's an opisopic tower. Uh, then an opisopic space is uh, an opisopic tower first. And then uh, a witness for, this, for the following square. I mean, a witness of commutativity for this square. Okay, what is the square? We start with, uh, let's say we have PI plus two into BD of PI plus one in particular. So applying this equivalence that I, we, we used many times before in reverse, we get some polynomial, uh, let's say call it uh, PI plus two bar, whatever. Uh, into pi plus one star times pi plus one, right? Uh, this is just using the fact that these two polynomials on the right have the same operations. So we can kind of do this lifting. And so the square that we look at is has this here, and then the two projections into the product. And here, pb of pi. So the bottom map uh, was well, just part of the structure and the right map is uh, what we've done before too. So we first go to BDPI star and then use the magma structure of BDPI. So we have some witness inside here. That's an epitopic space. So, I mean, the, the, the ideal thing would be that re re this really matches uh, the, the notion of uh, pre-sheaf over the category of epitopes, but okay not actually claiming this yet. Uh, and then what we do is we have the Siegel condition. Now it's very easy to state this. It's just that the fact that the map PI plus one bar into PI plus one, no, PI star is an equivalent. So yeah, the idea is that this PI star so these are kind of like horns, right? Because we have only a half of what we need for a boundary. We only have the tree part of a boundary. We don't have the lid, which is the 
the single operation that kind of closes the surface. And so we're saying that the next type up, the, the next family of fillers for these boundaries is actually completely determined by the horn, which is yeah, I'm going to say the single condition. And so, well, the claim, I mean, this is actually quite easy to see. So there's maybe some, could say it's a theorem, but it's pretty much straightforward, is that, um, so uh, let's say a seagull or, or a potopic, seagull, uh, what do they call it? Space, maybe say type. A potopic seagull type, the same thing as a polynomial monad, meaning a coherent polynomial map. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, another look at it, which for me, I mean, it was really helpful to understand the idea behind it. And yeah, so basically that's what I wanted to, to present. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. I'll now unmute everyone's microphone and we're gonna have a round of applause. So uh, let's see, unmute all. Okay, uh, should, no? I'm gonna move back to mute all. Ah, yes, very good. Um, okay. And now we're going to have uh, 24 minutes for questions, comments, um, anything else that comes to mind. Uh, usually when I teach, I also offer students an opportunity to insult me, um, but um, I don't know. Yes. Just, you, you said at the beginning that you thought there's some potential problems with this modeling the correct notion. Can you say briefly what those are? Yeah, so as I said, I really don't have a, something that can be put into the form of a precise statement. But basically, you go through uh, an example that I, I like. It's kind of useful to illustrate what's going on here, which is the example where you have uh, just one, just a type, A, and you want to put an infinity monoid structure on A. So it's a very special case of an infinity category where you have only one, uh, one object. So that's a, polyno a polynomial that you start with as A as operations and only one sort and uh, only one parameter for every operation. And, and then you go through this and it seems, so it works pretty well for the first few levels and then there is something strange happening at uh, when you look at the uh, uh, coherence of associativity. So the first level, a magma structure on this is simply a map that takes a list of A and gives you an A, which is what you expect, so an unbiased definition of a monoid. Then the next level up, the subdivision invariance for this is uh, generalized associativity for the, for the monoid structure, which means you have some arbitrary parenthesization of a list of A's, that's a tree, right? And on one, on one side, you can uh, apply the operation following the parentheses, and you get an A. On the other side, you can remove the parentheses and then apply one single operation, and those match. So you have a witness of this. And the next level up, what you get uh, is, I mean, according to what I computed, which may be wrong, but it does seem this uh, is that you get a pair of something that is what you expect to be the correct thing. So what is the correct thing? It's already complicated. So you, it's, a, it's a witness that says that for any uh, kind of op uh, four opotope that's labeled with elements of A on the leaves, you can build a witness of generalize associativity following the structure of the opotope, or you can first convert it to a single tree and use, and use the previous level of coherence to get a single uh, witness of a generalized associativity and those match. So it's what you expect. No? So you, if you, it's coherence for associativity in the most general unbiased sense possible. Uh, but that's only one component of what you get. The second component is some strange 
loop that really should, it's just, uh, it's not something that should be there as far as I can tell, but it appears as a side effect of the encoding, I think. And so, yeah, I don't know how to turn this into an actual country example, but it doesn't look like it, it works. And I, I think, I mean, there is a way to see why there is something strange in, in this definition, especially when looking at opotopic spaces from that point of view. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, if there's time, I, maybe I can show you in terms of opotopic spaces what I think is a bit suspicious about this. Go for it. Okay. All right, so let me share this again. All right, so, yes. So here we had uh, this square. So we, uh, we uh, require this uh, square to be commutative. But you see that uh, this, this I plus two here, you know? So this suggests that there's, uh, I mean, if there's a problem, there might be a, a problem with I plus three because then we're only using these three levels here. We're not using the full extent of what we have at that point, right? So when we go to say three, this is going to be, P, uh, so I equals one, say. There's going to be three, two, and one, and we're not using zero, right? But so uh, more, more precisely, what we have is that, let's see, so pi plus three is over pi uh, plus two star and pi plus two. And we're requiring this to commute, yeah? But you see that bd pi plus one is defined using pi plus one star and pi plus one but not the more precise version of this, which would be pi plus one star fiber product pi plus one over bd of pi. Yeah. Because the commutativity that we had one level lower will tell us that this is something that we can do. And actually everything would work, it seems, if we just replace uh, the, this bottom polynomial with this other one over bd of pi but actually we're forgetting the previous levels of this, um, this coherence of, of, of this uh, witness here to, to, to get the new witness. So I think this is what's, what's going wrong. And if you actually do this more refined version and you apply it to the example, you get the correct thing, at least at that level. And I think, yeah, it, it really works. But the problem is that now if you really want to take this uh, to, to infinity, it seems you really get into this usual loop that we don't know how to define or well, you know like uh, there's uh, the definition of uh, what, what the what the square is at every level would depend on all the previous levels and we cannot really encode this in a nice inductive form yeah. but uh, so that would kind of uh, be bad news but so the the conjecture is uh, and like talking to Eric, that seems to kind of be the case that actually you need to do this only for a finite amount of levels. And I think maybe just the next level up would be enough. So you would have a condition for, for something being an opotopic space, which is this square commutes, and then some other thing commutes starting from level three, and, that's, and then now this is enough. And this is due to the fact that, you know, iterating this uh, BD construction enough times kind of makes things uh, nicer and nicer and basically the coherence only seems to require a, a few finite small amount of levels. But okay, this is mostly speculation, at least for me. Uh, that's my hope to try to resolve this problem. All right, any other questions? Please don't be shy. May I have a question? Go for it. Mm, uh, in your math theorem, you, may, uh, you provide that the, uh, the, Siegel, the Siegel homotopy type using your, the 
opitopic um, type mm -hmm. uh, have some can get some relationship with um, the polynomial monad right yes so i think in the previous talk um, um, a polynomial monad can be some sort of analytic monad right uh yeah, so I think the terminology there is uh, analytic monad will be a polynomial monad. Uh, so in my representation three, remember that there's a choice of the universe. If you pick that universe to be the universe of finite types, then, and then you do this, and that's, that's what you get. If I'm not mistaken, that's what's called an analytic monad. So it's, it's just uh, the same, but uh, restricted to the case where you have finite fibers. For the, so finite, finite parities, so finite three uh, polynomial monad. So, I mean, it's not uh, such an important distinction, I think. So is it possible to find um, some analytic property of um, such um, opotopic, mon opotopic type? Um, yeah, uh, well, I don't know if I understand the question, but so if you're only interested in analytic monads, then what you do is just, just uh, play the same game, but you require every polynomial that you come across to be a finite polynomial. So a polynomial such that the fibers of the p-map, the map in the center, are finite. And then you get analytic monads. Okay, thank you. Right, more questions? Uh, just, just one quick question. Um, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Um, uh, my question was about the, this notion, you, you say opotopic type, um, but it looks like this definition is slightly more general than what me, people would sort of normally think of as a pre-sheaf on opotopes. Is, could you comment on that? Because yeah, yeah. It, it seems to depend on the first polynomial. And the yeah, first yeah polynomial. That, that's right, that's right. Okay. So, okay. yeah, so you would have to, okay, you need to constrain it a little bit to make it really equivalent to opotopic type. Okay. The conjecture would be uh, an opotopic uh, type where P0 is the trivial 1, 1, 1, 1 polynomial. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, okay, that's, I just wanted to check that. We were yeah, there. yeah, yeah. So, but maybe you will actually want to start with, uh, I mean, yeah, that should be right something else like if you start with the the universe of finite types then you get yeah. symmetric opitopes yeah, yeah, right. yeah yeah okay yeah that was just my comment yeah. all right eric do you do you agree that there's potentially a problem with the setup um yeah, I think I think his concern is is correct uh, that the definition, as stated, probably needs to be adjusted. Um, uh, it would be fixed if some other things that I've sort of been working on end up working out. So it will just take some time to see if uh, if that happens or not. But uh, yeah, it looks like there there is a problem with the way it's stated right now. All right, further questions, comments? We still have a couple of minutes. Um, okay, final call for uh, whoever wants to ask a question. Okay, if there are no further questions and no further comments, Ali, um, before I unmute everyone, it's better now than uh, after. Okay, then I'll unmute everyone and we're going to thank Paul again for this great talk. Right on, right. Paul. <laughs>